So, uh, dude, how you been, man? Doing well. Life's going Doing good? Well. Yeah. Life is great. Yeah? Um, okay, so I've known you for, what, how long? A year? A two years? years now. Two, yeah, two years, something like years, that. Yeah. Uh, cigars. Cigars are great. Had a, had a lot of those over time. <laughs> <laughs> What's your go-to cigar? Do you have a brand that you yeah, like? Yeah, I like Perdomo's a lot. Perdomo? Yeah, I, th- I would say Perdomo's are probably That sounds favorite. like a, an expensive brand. Is yeah. It, that is was, it? I was just hoping they were going to give me an advertising fee for, yeah. you know, you know, telling it on your <laughs> podcast here. <laughs> oh, man, good stuff. Okay, well, the, the audience doesn't know you, so uh, tell me about yourself. Like, what's your, you know, uh, what was your upbringing like? Did you have a good family? That kind of stuff. Like, just. So, yeah, I grew up in a single, house, a single uh, mother household. Uh, never had a dad in the house. So just my mom adopted me. Okay. Um, what adopted at birth? What was the like circumstances surrounding that? Uh, well, my um, I don't know. I was uh, I was a little kid. Yeah, <laughs> you were a baby. You don't remember? <laughs> yeah, I don't really know. Like uh, I just know that my mom adopted me. She was a she was a great mom. We obviously had single parent struggles and everything like that. You yeah, know? but she was a lawyer, so she had some advantages. Good lawyer, not a great business person. Honestly. What type of law did she practice? She was mostly family law. Okay. Um, a lot she of was divorces. A lot of divorces oh and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> that messes you up. Yeah, every, every relationship you get in, you're like, uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see the worst of it. You <laughs> yeah, know. you see the worst of it. So, I would say that that was probably the most jarring thing about childhood. Is yeah. just I would literally witness the worst. Divorces, like almost first, almost firsthand, like a spectator. And you feel like that had an effect on your relationships? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It definitely. Uh, Do you have a lot of trust issues? I don't have a lot of trust <laughs> issues, but I have a lot of like issues around the idea of, um, okay, maybe I have some trust issues. A little bit. <laughs> Probably a little bit. That's funny. Um, so, okay, so, so you, you uh, were raised by a single mother, so you just were never curious about the so, circumstances around the adoption? Not really at that time, but I'll tell you what. So as I was getting into school and everything like that, um, it became really interesting. I was clearly, um, I was clearly my own guy. And I didn't really want to listen to what other people prescriptions for my life were, hmm. so I was very hard. I was I was very much a terrible, terrible student. Like I think they put me into IQ tests so many times just to make sure there wasn't something wrong up in there because <laughs> I just they. <laughs> Was it a focus thing or a procrastination thing or like, it was, did you just not? It understand? was. I was not interested in the material. I was loved learning, and I was very, it was very easy to learn. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, when I took the IQ test, I did extremely well on them. But I just was not interested in learning uh, what they were teaching. Yeah, I, you know, they would be teaching, uh, and you know, first grade material, and I'd be sitting there trying to read the Wall Street Journal. Right. I was really weird like that. So, like, at what age was that? Like literally first grade, I'd be like. So you're reading newspapers in first. Grade? Oh yeah, I was really? like, I was all about world events and I was all about history and well, just learning whatever I could. But I just wasn't interested in learning whatever they were teaching in school. And, yeah, and they could not get me interested in it unless it was lunch. Hmm. I was real interested in that. Well, I, okay. Well, I have to come back to this. I would think that if I knew that I was adopted, I would want to know, like, what happened. I would want. I would. You know I would what? be really I, curious. Like, okay, like, I'm not going to hold this against you. I forgive you. I love you. Maybe even. But like, what? Why didn't you keep me? Mom? I think honestly, I wasn't that interested because my mom and I were close. Mm-hmm. She was very much like a protector for me. She very much she would go into the school, for example. And You're saying your adopted mother. My adopted or, mother. Okay. Yeah. She was very much like, uh, you know, somebody very close to me. I just thought of her as my mom. I never yeah. even thought about it. And I never really, and, and when I did think about the idea of a birth family, I never would want to insult my my mm. adopted mom and right. think of, you know, so I just didn't really think about it much. Was she single when she adopted you? Or was she married? She was or? single. She, oh, she was a lawyer, so she was able to do something that wasn't typical back in the 70s, which is um, have a single family, a single parent adoption, which is yeah. very rare. Well, that's a lot of commitment. Do you know why she adopted you? 
Like what she Yeah, I it? think she was a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Honestly, I think she was a glutton. Well, I must be too, because I like hanging out with you. So. Well, that's because I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you started reading the Wall Street Journal in first grade and just... I don't yeah, know, all right. I, so I, then I convinced my mom <clears throat> later on, like a couple of years later, yeah. to buy me stock in, in, in a company of my choice. Okay. And it did really well. It was McDonald's. McDonald's, yeah, okay. Yeah, but it was... But... You know, McDonald's a few years ago was outperforming, like, any of the tech stocks. Really? Yeah. It, was, huh. it crushes it from time you to time. You would think they would have capped out by this point. So but. then we would, she would take me to the shareholders meetings, and then I started, like, getting real interested in business at that point. And, and this uh, is like you're still in elementary school at this point? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm a little crazy, right? And then... <clears> um, we like she's we started I started going to those. My first job ever was actually at this country club called Butler Country Club. Okay. Right next door to the McDonald's headquarters. Yeah. So who do I end up uh caddying for? A bunch. Fred Turner. Okay. He was I think they had some weird title for him. He was like the grand chairman of McDonald's at that point. Oh, that's funny. And but what he was, if you if you ever watch the movie The Founder, he's he he has a part in that in that movie like his, his he has an actor play him or he has, an a act, he has an actor play okay, him gotcha and um he and he, he was the guy that was flipping the burgers more efficiently than everybody else and he okay. ended up be, he ended up basically writing the first mcdonald's manual wow. on how to operate a, a, yeah. the restaurant and he was just very very smart guy an operations focused guy and he taught me a lot he was a really nice guy to me yeah so, so he was very very nice and so your mom how did your mom have a? Did she have like some type of connection to the uh, to the executive board or something? No, or no. The... It, they did offer her to be the head of like. They did offer her job one time to be the head of um, real estate transactions. Like she was a lawyer, so they were mm-hmm. going to run all their real estate portfolio for uh, like the southern U.S. or something like that. Yeah. And so, but that had no connection to that. I picked out the stock. I picked out like what I wanted to do, and I just happened to get a job at that country. But club. How, how did you become? Uh, I don't know if you guys were friends, but like, how did you get that connection? How did that happen? By chance. Okay. But do you want to hear a crazy story? Yes, I do. So I am sitting. I'm up at the holidays. I meet my birth family many, many years later. Right. I end up sitting and talking with my mom, and you know what she tells me she did for a job? What? She worked for a guy with the last name Butler. Who owned all of Oak Brook, Illinois at one point, which is where McDonald's was, where yeah. and I worked at Butler Country Club. Yeah. And so wow. she worked for the guy who was part of the family. And he had a interesting reputation. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got an exposure to the business pretty early on. Yeah, it I, like. and I also my mom had a very good friend that was a um um a CFO for several companies and things like that. And yep. he would sit there. When I was like seven years old, he, the guy was teaching me how to do corporate taxes, was teaching me how to do personal taxes. Yep. So I just like learned all that kind of stuff early on. So the guy, the the grand chairman guy. Uh, I call him Grand Poobah. You just, you just bumped into him one day and he was like, hey, you seem like a No, no, he, I, he called, I was a caddy working at Butler Country that's right, Club. That's right, And <clears> then he, I just randomly got par- paired with him. And I was the worst caddy known to man. <laughs> I would lose people's golf clubs, like uh, pack yeah. on holes, and they'd have to give me the uh, the cart to go run back and get yeah. you know people's clubs. But I made more tips than anybody at the yeah. club because I broke all the rules and I yeah. would talk to people and just. So it, is that mostly the context that you t- got to? have conversations with him with yeah, it, yeah. while you were caddying for yeah. him. And I did with a lot of business people. Yeah. I remember these uh these uh Japanese businessmen. I don't I do not remember the names. They used to come in quite a bit. They had some toy company that they owned or were the top executives for or something. And yeah. I remember they took a real liking to me. Um and they would tell me all kinds of stuff uh, about how they operated their business and I, I thought it was I thought it was really interesting with them because yeah. I remember the first time I they were having lunch in between their like their ninth and their second round of uh, golf holes or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what you call it. I, Anyways, you play golf still? <laughs> not really much. <laughs> anyway, the second the, the the back nine, you know, yeah. I guess is what we call. It. But uh, they were they were having lunch in between, 
and uh, they see me walking by, and they all jump up on the window, all these Japanese guys. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Okay, so you had a so you had early exposure to politics. It seems like you just had like a natural inclination towards politics. Yeah, just I, like just I, curious and reading about it. So and... yeah, so like I ended up. I was always so my mother went through this period of depression. Is actually how this got started. It was like this two years severe depression, and she was not functioning. She lost her biggest clients and like wasn't making any money. So finally, mm-hmm. she got to a point where she wasn't really getting out of bed. You know. Man. And um, I found that I could eat really well if I went and argued politics with the Democrats across the street. Okay. And I always took the Republican position because that's generally what I believed at that time. But I'd go argue politics for food. Yeah. That's where I learned how to. They're just like regulars that hung out at that restaurant. That no, they, these, these were people who lived across or? the street from me. <clears throat> okay, and they were very—they were actually very nice people. Yeah. But I would go argue politics with them, and they'd give us dinner every night. That's awesome. Heck yeah! So, dude. yeah. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, like, do you remember how old you might have been, or like what? Oh man, that lasted. That was. I must have been eight, ten, yeah, something like that around there. I, so it all jumbles together at this right. age, you know. I basically need a cane here soon. So by the time you're in middle school, you've, you've, you know, you have some type of idea of what even politics is. I didn't. I wasn't even yeah. like aware of politics until I was like fourteen or fifteen. So we, we also, <clears throat> my mother had. Uh, really wanted to raise cats. She's like, I guess where she was a crazy cat lady, right? No, she was, <laughs> she wasn't crazy. That she just wanted to like raise Siamese cats. And we got the, our cats got hit with the Cleesey virus because somebody gave her a Siamese cat that had the Cleesey virus and it, yeah. Cleesey virus can wipe out, uh, wipe out your cats. And so we got hit with that and we had a lot of cats dying. So we got real close to this veterinarian and he happened to be friends with the Bushes, the Reagans and everybody else. And he's the one, really the one, took me out to his farm. I got to meet- A veterinarian? The, yeah. Got Did to, he like operate on their animals or something or how? how yeah. uh, no, so his wife was the uh, chairperson of the DuPage County uh, party. She was on the national committee. Okay. She had, they had spent the night at the White House with the Bushes. I don't know how they met them all, but they were a pretty wealthy family. Yeah. And this guy, Dr. Arndt, really took a liking to me as a kid and took me out to his farm to go hunting with politicians out there and just, like, bro. really bro, put me in the mix of it. And that's yeah. when I knew. I was like, I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> so then what? So then, so now you're, so, like, meeting these politicians? So then, and... fast forward, um, I... I reminded you that I was a terrible student, and I had to go to the bad kid school for a year. Did you graduate? This is in eighth grade. Okay. I did everything. I went through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but did you graduate? No. Yeah, I ended up graduating. Jeez. I graduated. Well, I mean, but, you turned out okay, so it doesn't matter now. But, it's but still... No, I did. I graduated, but it was funny how I graduated. Well, that's a story for All right. later. All right, we'll get there. Um, but what's funny is, um, so we... Um, I lost my train of thought here. No, uh, you're good. You're talking about, uh, so you start meeting these politicians, um, uh, and then you said fast forward a little bit. Y- yeah, so, um, you know, we we are, I get sent uh, to this bad kid, kind of like naughty kid school, right? Okay. Because uh, we're just a bunch of, Did you, you get know, expelled? Um, yeah, they, they didn't. I was uh, requested not to come back <laughs> into my, the school I went to in seventh grade, so in eighth grade. I go to this. But I have to ask, was it, sorry to keep interrupting you, was it grade related? Was it just grades or was it behavioral issues? It was a combination of I was the worst behaved kid in the school okay. <laughs> and I had the worst grades in the school. Like, did you get in fights a lot or did you play oh, pranks yeah, on like, people oh, or what was Yeah, the... all of the above. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> to give you an idea, they had these things called lion's points at the school. Yeah. They're like demerits, I guess. And you're allowed to lose. You're allowed to lose. I think 15 in a semester. Yeah. I broke the school record from when it was open in two, uh, 1955. It was like 300 and some. Oh old my gosh. Lions points lost. Yeah. And 300. Demerits. I was literally trying to lose <laughs> the points. I, I literally. I just. You're just trying to break the record. At I that was point. a terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible student, and oh I was gosh. not having it. Yeah. You know the problem was I, the school always just bored me to death. Yeah. You know, and it's, I don't know, it just was not my thing, Yeah, (laughs) clearly. Yeah. But I went to Catholic school the next year. Okay. Because they would accept me. Yeah. 
They're like, okay, we'll take this old yeah. jerk. Well, the Bible does say, you know, the least of these. You know, you yeah. help the least I was these. the least. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely the least. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I was the least on, like, you know, with a magnifying glass, right. you know. So, but they, so that was like your senior year, or that you said that was eighth no, grade? No, so that was eighth grade. Ninth grade, I went to the Catholic school. I actually started doing pretty well. I was the first kid suspended. Yeah. But they didn't put up with that. And uh, mm-hmm. so some kids shoved me in line, and I turned around and decked them. Yep. Yeah, I punched them. And so I got suspended. And so if someone put, that's justified, though. Yeah, Why yeah. would you get suspended for that? I've never understood that. Because we both did. Yeah, and the but, nuns. Like, yeah. but if but if if someone puts their hands on you, and have you ever gone to a Catholic you, school? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I disagree <laughs> with that decision. By uh, the way. Yeah. No. Like I was, but you know what? He did shove me. I don't think they saw him shove me. They just saw me turn around, and deck him. Yeah. They always see the. Response. They always see the response because my <laughs> response was maybe a little over the top. <laughs> But he didn't realize, this little Catholic school kid did not realize that I came from public school, and that's a different world. Mm. You don't get shoved. You get, yeah. If you do, you get somebody gets punched. Right. So I. Yeah. So anyways, I ended up doing okay. But then we moved out here, and what was that, 1992 to Colorado. And um, I get back into being a troublemaker again. But then I found this teacher, these two teachers, Tom Minx and then Robert, uh, Tim Roberts, I'll never forget their, they uh, they kind of like believed in me. They are like, mm. this is like the smartest kid. They would tell me, like, you are the smartest kid we've ever had in this, <laughs> this class. You yeah. Know, this, and they just, Was that, was that, um, did you kind of like just assume that you weren't very smart when you were no, younger, I was when new, you were a kid? I was always <laughs> knew I was smart. It was just nice to have somebody actually believe right. in me for yeah. once. And so that a was a good teacher or two can make the world a difference in someone's like development in their life. Like, you yeah. know, I don't know. So there was this big contest for Cinco de Mayo. Okay. And you had to have like the best, like, you know, door design for Cinco de Mayo. I put so much effort into it. And then because I was in the bad kid class, um, we had by far the b- best door design. Like, hands down, everybody like thought we were going to win. Everybody thought we were going to win. Yeah. Principal goes around and says, oh, I'm not going to let that class win. They get docked points, basically. What? Yeah, so I got, like, I got, yeah, screwed out of that. So the teacher mm. took me out and he bought me the prize. Yeah. Good. He's like, that's BS. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I went to a school when I was a kid that would not allow me to, because I got stuck in the little, you know, uh, the learning disabled class for okay. a while. And they would not let you earn more than a C, ever. You are not allowed to earn more than a C. So that was just, yeah. Yeah, I was never, mo- this is why I was never motivated to, like, do mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. And I was always thinking about, like, world politics or something else. I was, yeah. just never cared. So, <laughs> so you understand that. <laughs> right. It's like when I'm, when I'm laying awake in bed at night, I'm like, okay, how do we solve the national debt crisis? And I'm, like, figuring out, That's okay, here, here's the budget. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It's not that hard. It's not. You just got to stop being oh, an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Like, hey, guys, there's only, like, five places that all this money goes to. Let's you just... know, it's actually very hard to solve it because if you're thinking rationally, you know, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. We'll be... get to that in a minute, though. Right. We'll okay, get to... we'll get there. We'll get there. So I'll, I will tell you. So as I, as I move forward, I meet this lady out here at a party, okay. older lady, who realizes I'm a Republican. I tell her I'm a Republican. She's a Republican. She happens to be a leader at the local party. So she invites me to start coming to this lunch club they have. And I I said, sure. And she's like, I'll sponsor you. So yeah. they did. They sponsored me. I started going to this lunch club. Next thing you know, I start meeting all these politicians. And very quickly, I ended up on the campaigns as a volunteer. Very quickly, they realized I knew how to win. Yep. And... You know, I am a Republican, so that's kind of a knock against is this, you. Is this after high school? Uh, this is during. Okay. I was like 15, 14. No way. Yeah. So 14. you're on political campaigns. As, as yeah, a, I'm 14, 15. On one hand, I'm doing that. On the other hand, I'm like probably committing what would be considered a felony. <laughs> you know, I'm, I had like was living a double life almost. Yeah. I was like on one hand, I was out there causing trouble. Hmm. And on the other hand, I was out there you know, I go. I guess just doing stupid stuff with your friends, or yeah, it was just yeah. yeah, just dumb stuff just being there. A kid. But on the other hand, I was, but yeah, but it was more on the the bad element of Uh-oh. what kids do. You know? I was Drugs. A trouble. I was a troublemaker. 
Well, we did you smoke a joint? Tell the truth. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I did not. I'm not going to tell you what I did because I don't know if, what the statute of limitations is. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, anyway, you're causing trouble, but you're also have, living this double life. But, yeah, so I start meeting, like, <clears throat> Senator Allard, and he was very nice to me. His dad was very nice to me. Yeah. What so, state? Um, Bob Schaefer, right here. Okay. And then I meet this guy running for Congress, Bob Schaefer, who was very, very, very nice to me. I've heard that name. I ended up on all their campaigns, and... The, and then I ended up running a lieutenant governor's race. It was kind of like I never got real credit for it because this guy was the worst politician. <laughs> like this guy was horrible. He screwed mm-hmm. his brother over and everybody else. Yeah. But I ended up running this guy's campaign as his deputy campaign manager, and I put together this ground game that is just incredible. Yeah. And I got a lot of credit for it. Next thing you know, fast forward a little bit, I worked my way through. Somebody, one of, the, one of the campaigns I worked on got me onto the Bush campaign in 2004. Um, I started work in uh, uh, northern Colorado, and I did something very unique. I got the college Republicans for the entire state to agree to give me their volunteer hours, and I was like their liaison for the state, you know? Yeah. And it was just, it was super cool. It was just super cool, like, what we were able to accomplish. And so they Mm -hmm. brought me out to D.C. working for the inaugural committee. So basically, when you worked for the Bush campaign, your your territory was, like, northern Colorado. Like, you were supposed to, like... Yeah, I worked in northern Colorado. I was really working on the ground game. But Hmm. then I became in charge of the whole state. What was your job title? For the college Republicans. What? What was, like, your job title or your position title? Like, field director. Okay. But then I ended up becoming, like, the head of the guy who ran college Republicans for the state. Yeah. The head of the college Republicans, like, reported directly to me. Now, we kind of concocted the deal together. Yeah. Over a, you know, non-alcoholic cocktail. <laughs> uh, you were underage. I get it. No. <laughs> I wasn't. I don't know. Uh, he wasn't either, actually. He was liable. Yeah. So... But that was a good, it was a very good campaign, and I, I made a name for myself there. Yeah. Then, when I, after the inaugural committee, I had a hard time getting brought into the administration because I did not go finish college. I left to go out there. Yeah. They and, wanted college graduates. Yeah, it was a little, there's a, definitely a bias towards the college yeah. graduates. Well, especially in the, what was that, the 90s, the late 90s, early 2000s? 2000s yeah. yeah. It was like 2004. College was much more. Like, respected back then, you know. It was like, whoa, okay, you got a college degree. Yeah, it's... until you find out the idiots you get out of it sometimes. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're but... definitely not wrong about that. <laughs> I know, because I went to college. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, like, the biggest uh, idiot of them all. Yeah, there you go. I was like you broke the, another record. The king idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, um... When I was out there, I ended up, what I ended up doing is I meet this group who does political consulting, and they do a lot of stuff for the White House, and, I mean, they, this, this guy is, like, one of the most connected political advisors in the country, and he realizes that I'm, I'm good at this, and he, he brought me on board, and next thing you know, I'm doing all kinds of fun stuff in D.C. Yeah. I'm doing, you know, doing around D.C., yeah. ran campaigns in Maryland, Virginia, you, you name it. You were living in D.C.? Mm-hmm. How long? I lived there eight years. Okay. Yeah. And well, like, come on, what are you doing? Just be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the truth, bro. <laughs> Is that a red dot I see going around? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we helped. I mean, we did a lot of political consulting, helping campaigns, you know, okay. get off the ground. A lot of, like, we were a mailhouse, a political consulting group. We did work for a lot of leadership. We did work with the White House. We would help. Uh, you know, my boss would help maneuver bills to get passed, and my job was to make sure that people were saying yes. And, yeah. And power. Yep. People in power said yes. Yeah. So, like, I don't know. I guess a lot of people have this idea of the cigar, you know, the smoke filled room in the back. Yeah, there's a place called Shelly's, actually. It's oh, yeah? a cigar bar in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a really good bar. And what happens there? Yeah, you go sit down. It, it, I will say. <clears throat> Most of the way D.C. operates is probably different than most people think. Yeah. D.C. operates, it's a social structure. Okay. And people can be very nice in D.C. People Mm. can be very, very nice and be very helpful and be very genuine. But then uh, it's very tempting when you're in actual leadership or anything like that not to just become so corrupt. Right. Because the temptations are just so overwhelming. 
Hmm. Um, and you don't so really get ahead unless you offering you, you money or jobs or what do you mean? Yeah, you yeah. You, you just don't really get ahead unless you are corrupt. Hmm. You have to have a little bit of corruption, which is kind of why an outsider is refreshing. But they will hate you. Right. They will. Ne- they're never going to permit an outsider to to be a part of that club hmm. because. I think at some level they really want to make sure they got something on you. Well, and also DC is like its own little bubble. So like, yeah, you have the the you know people offering you jobs, you know, the revolving door or whatever, uh, money and money. All that stuff. But you know what but the also if primary. you're friends, if you're friends with these people, there's the added social pressure. Oh, of, there is. Like, you know what? If you're like, for example, if you're a Democrat and you and you want to go out and be pro-life because you morally believe that being pro-life is the way to go. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. You know what the social pressure against that is? It's insane. Yeah. It's insane. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I, it's hard to blame the individuals there because it's so convoluted how that city runs. Yeah. Can it be fixed? Yeah, I, th- I think to a degree. What do you think would have to happen? That's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, that... What do I think would have to happen? Well, first of all, I think you need to limit the power of of the government. Okay. So I think in order to, you have to take away the allure for the money to go there. You can't just eliminate money from politics. There's that notion that you could do that. No, you actually have to take away the carrot, which is that five, six, seven trillion dollars, depending on who passes what budget this year. But it's at least $5 trillion that they're competing for. What would you do yeah. to control $5 trillion? Yeah. Probably a lot, right? right? It's alluring. So you got to take that away. Yeah. And you have to limit eat the power of the agencies to do whatever they want. you got to limit that. If you can limit government to its to a more focused mission and you and you don't let the, uh, and you put guardrails on that, yeah. The money is less likely to want to flow the way it does. Is there a policy that you think, if it were passed, that it would take a lot of the, you know, corruption and money out of politics? Like, what, well, I see, what, do you see a policy yeah, solution? Yeah, yeah, I think. Is that, it like term so, limits? Is it no. like, what's the deal? Yeah, I think that it's it, in a broad sense. Yes, it's limiting the scope and power of government. Yeah. but one area in particular. Currently, agencies can essentially make law by passing regulations without any real congressional oversight. Con- right. con- Congress basically writes in the bill that, oh, they have the right to... Agencies like CIA? Well, no, no, more like it's usually like EPA, you know, uh, gotcha. you know regulatory yeah. groups. And they just basically pass regulations that are essentially laws. Yeah. Well... No one voted for that, yeah. Yeah, you have bureaucrats running. And now you actually have this, like, attitude that the bureaucrats should just be able to tell the politicians what to do. Hmm. Actually, if you delve into the Trump cases a bit, there's actually a danger, if any of those cases actually stand, of making bureaucrats higher than the president in some sense. Hmm. If you let the documents case and things like that, there's actually things that if that were to be upheld, it would be very, very dangerous because you would have unelected bureaucrats overseeing the president, essentially, which hmm. is the only elect, only all power in the executive branch is vested with that guy, yeah. with the president. Hmm. And so there's some danger in things I'm seeing there. You do need to limit the power of the bureaucracy um, pretty heavily, I would say. Yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good bureaucrats, a lot of good folks in that town. But the, the system <clears throat> is what corrupts, not the individual. Do you think the... Um those type of agencies, does there just have to be congressional approval for if they're going to change? Yeah, I think Congress has to, like, um, oversee yeah. the regulatory piece of it. Hmm. I think that there needs to be some mechanism where Congress does it and that the agencies come to Congress. So because Congress has ceded so much of their authority, right. yeah, you know, the... Um, the um, Wasn't it like OSHA... Was it OSHA that tried to enforce the vaccine mandate? Or was it Yeah, the I think the OSHA did get was involved at one point. They lost it, I think. Right? Look, at the end of the day, we can all have disagreements about what we should do with the, the, the vaccine, right? Yeah. 
<clears throat> but we should never veer off of the uh, and break the rights of people. And the problem is when you have a government at a certain point that can just tax you at will, take whatever they want, and they can pass laws without Congress, who are you accountable to? Right. And so what we really need to see in D.C. is probably an accountability effort. Yeah. And a real effort to include accountability in every level. The, okay. So just kind of like on that train of thought, do you think that the FBI and the CIA uh, have too much power? I think that they uh, there has been, the the agents down through the agency. Yeah. I think are fine people. I've met a lot of CIA, FBI guys, and they're like they're good guys. Yeah. But what's happened over time is there are certain presidents who have politicized and put their people into positions, mm -hmm. and, and it's allowed to permeate. And, and what you right. get is this almost like social structure mm -hmm. that starts, starts to take hold. Another thing, one thing you could do that would fix a lot is if you, had, if you actually had a political diversity bill in the government. Okay. Right now it's 97% or something like that of all uh, federal bureaucrats are Democrats. Yeah. If you actually had a political diversity bill where the, the agency needed to look more like the, the population, like a third, a third, a third, yeah. I think what you would see is a lot better governance. Hmm. I'm not knocking the Democrats on yeah. this, actually. I'm just saying you can't, you can't well, have a— Well, they played the game the right way. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah exactly. And them. you can't really say that um, they shouldn't have done it. Their, their job is to win. Yeah. Their job is to get their people in. And, and frankly— Typically, Democrats are more drawn to government work, while Republicans tend to be more into private, private. sector yeah. work. But I think we need to have a little bit more balance inside of our government yeah. because you don't want Republicans running the show either you, you, because you need to have that balance because if Republicans control everything, they go way too far. When Democrats control everything, they go way too far. Yeah. And we just need we need to get back to that political center in a mm. sense where we can where we can get along and we can go have a beer with each other afterwards after we yeah. just told you like, like you're a Democrat <laughs> right and you're not but let's say if you were I could call you an idiot and then you call me an idiot and then we go have a beer yeah right that's the way it should be yeah for sure man gosh there's so much there so many different like <laughs> <laughs> paths you could go down on that but. Uh, so like okay, so you were t so you were saying like your job was to get <coughs> um, basically the votes the vote outcome that you desired is that did I understand well, you correctly? Yeah, for for Congress a lot of the, so like the president had an agenda, you know he needed people riled up. We'd help with that. We'd help yeah. with um, supporting candidates that you know the party wanted to see win. Or yeah, you know, the president. And, and, and that's the other thing is. So is there a lot of negotiation? Yeah, and that's the, that's actually the beauty of our system. It's, mm. it's a lot of negotiation. Yeah, and there are good people that that, but there's also a lot of uh, money that influences good people. Yeah. So was that part of your job? Was they make it? I'll tell you something real quick. All right, I'm ready. They literally make it sometimes so hard to see that you're being corrupted. Hmm. That you end up down a path of corruption where you become so much more corrupt and you look back and you didn't realize that you got there. Right. Well, it just seems normal. It's like driving down the street stoned. You got there, but you don't have any idea how. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, so in these negotiations, surely you don't want to appear in any negotiation from a weak position. No. You know, with no ability to, like... You don't know. So hey, if you don't do this, then something's going to happen. So. You definitely got you got to, your job when you're doing that is to find out what leverage you have on somebody. Yeah. And that what, leverage can take a whole lot of different. And is, and are you talking like, hey, I know this thing that you did, or is it like, hey, you know, we're going to donate to your campaign if you help us out? Or like what, what really is so like going on in those situations? So typically you just, so typically you're talking about campaign contributions that okay. you can bring to the table. And typically yeah. you start, you start there. Um, eventually, yeah, I th you know, there's, there's the worst that can go on in that town. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, you never did anything like that, but like other people who are. Yeah, but look, at the end of the day. There are. I will tell you. So I'd sit down and I'd go argue politics with Democrats all the time. They passionately believe what they believe. Yeah. 
I passionately believe what I believe. Yeah. And it takes negotiation to get to a spot. Now, one of the things, the dangers I see in D.C. now is, and on both sides, is both sides want to shout down the other side, Hmm. you know. I think a lot of the culture has become, I'm going to win at all costs versus let's do what's right for the country at all costs. Hmm. And I think that makes the negotiations a lot harder. And so what you tend to see is instead of negotiating, we're going to set up an army to go obliterate you and we're going to cancel you. We're going to cancel your friends. And I don't see how there's freedom in that. Right. I don't see how we're a free country Hmm. when if you disagree, you're going to get destroyed. Yeah. I don't see it. I don't like it either. Yeah. I don't like it one bit. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So that's kind of your, uh, did you do anything with politics after that? It sounds like basically you're a consultant. Yeah, I did. I've done a little bit of advising here and there. Yeah. Not take, you know, just as a friendly advice. uh, And after Bush was out, was that... Pretty much it for you? No, I mean, I stuck around for four years of, of uh, Obama. Okay. And so... Yeah. How did that... How what, how different was the dynamic after Bush left? Like, surely your job as a Republican the, would be would The agencies harder. were becoming a lot more uh, politicized at yeah. that point. Um, but one of the things I noticed, there's a thing called the Hatch Act in the government. And the Hatch Act basically says, you you know, even political appointees can't be playing politics in the office, so to speak. Yeah. Can't can't be be endorsing in the office. You got to stay kind of right. separated from the political. Isn't, isn't that doesn't that relate to you can't use government money? Is it government money that you can't use to support? Yeah, political sort of, campaigns or something like no, that. No, this is a little different, right? This is like your personal activities okay. if you're working for the government. And even in political, can't even do it. Political appointees. Yeah. Huh. So under the Bush administration, they were very careful not to allow violations of the Hatch Act. Did it occur? I'm sure it did. Yeah. But it wasn't because of a policy of the, the president. Under Obama, I'd noticed that there was a lot more violation and going after people for their political beliefs hmm. if they disagreed. Yeah. And that's where things got dangerous. Yeah. But I think if you had to draw back to where things really started getting bad, you got to kind of throw this on the Republicans, too. Uh, I think the impeachment of Clinton was a terrible idea. Hmm. I think it led us down a tit-for-tat pathway that I don't see where it ends well. Yeah. So. Hmm. Yeah. It's scary. Well... I think we're kind of seeing you know, what that leads to, yeah. Yeah, and but we have to stop. So I, <laughs> I recommend. If Do you what, think Trump? Well, I'll let you finish your thought. I think ahead. if Trump gets elected, he should not go after Biden. I don't think they should impeach him either. Maybe not Biden, but what about? Uh, you can go after the underlings. Yeah. You can. If they did something illegal, you can go after them. But I mm-hmm. think my view is Biden has presidential immunity if you want to break that you need to impeach him and convict him oh man that's so hard i have such mixed yeah. feelings about yeah, that. yeah but you know what it's good because you like look what you're seeing now yeah you don't want to see that like it doesn't matter what party you're in right you, you gotta have order but doesn't there have to be some type of like you can justice uh, uh, for like it's like okay do you, you look, started this you have game, a choice. you smack him on the head and say, don't do this anymore? Well, I would put it this and way. He's going to meet his maker. Mm. He will. Yeah. You know, everybody meets their maker, and yeah. you, you're going to stand to be judged. Well, he's Catholic, so he's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think he's going to be stand to make his, he's going to meet, meet his maker. Yeah. And it's not going to be a pretty picture when people who are doing these rotten things do stuff like that. But I think Biden should not be impeached. He's done impeachable things, for sure. I think so. Really? But I don't think we should impeach him politically dumb. And I think it's Mm. bad for the country. And I actually think we should not go after him. You can go after his kid if he did something illegal. You can go after everybody around him. Yeah. And you can put people in jail when they did bad things. But you can't go after the president. Mm. It's more symbolic. The office is more important than the person. Mm. And I know that a lot of people think about it. Don't think... Don't don't be thinking about justice because maybe in the Democrats' mind they think what they're doing is justice against right. your guy Trump. It, maybe it is right. Yeah. Maybe in their mind they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah, it's hard because if if one side 
uh, is willing to do those things and one side isn't. You can then... still play you can still play hardball, prevent them from doing it. Yeah. You know, I, I would say if the Republicans really wanted to stop it right now, yeah. don't fund the FBI. Yeah. Don't fund the organization or the Justice Department. Just don't fund it. And then you you force a shutdown of that if they want their money. You yeah. just shut it down. If you don't want politics in your agencies, then the Republicans need to get off their butts and make it happen. And, yeah. they, and they have to do it in a way that, that through the in negotiating process. And that means making a tough decision and shutting the government down sometimes if it, if it means what the other side's doing is corrupt. Yeah. You stop them that way. Use the bud, the purse strings of the of the Congress. Yeah. What about the old uh, Vivek Ramaswamy prescription? Just get rid of the FBI. What would you think about that? Is I'm that too extreme. I, I I I'm not going to take a personal position on the FBI. I don't have like I don't actually think the agency is an all bad agency. Right. But I will say this. All bad. I would say that what you want to do with the um, agencies is you want to restrict them. And I do believe that the president can cut employees from the government, and he does have a right to cut duplicative programs yeah. legally. There does seem to be a capability of the president to cut a lot, and I think he should do it. And, okay, so it seems like uh, Congress Republicans, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like Maybe you think that they should just withhold funding until there's some concessions made. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like that's how you negotiate. Just hold, just, just I'm not saying that. I'm not until... saying we should collapse the government or right. anything. But the Democrats like are are much better at this. Just game. don't pass the budget until you get what you know. Some Shut basic, it down. Basic stuff. Like yeah. in this cra- in this garbage notion that you somehow are going to default. They know that's a lie. Hmm. They know it's a lie. You do not need to default. So what I would do. I'm president. Let's say President Trump wins, and you want to and you want to solve the problem. You go in there and start cutting, cutting, cutting. You can actually. I would. I would probably try to pass a budget with the cuts. They'll. They'll say uh, no. There. They'll. There'll be a government shutdown. You orchestrate a government shutdown. You declare an emergency, and under the guise of an emergency, you start laying everybody off. Hmm. That's what I'd do. Yeah. But they're never going to let me president because <laughs> I didn't finish college. <laughs> I, look, I, I just think that we, but we also need to get to a spot where both, where we can, where we can communicate with one another again. Because when I first got to D.C., you could go have a beer with people of the other party. You can't do that anymore. Really. Mm. It's hard. Yeah. And but you want to do that. So like you the know, whole Democrat, uni, the whole like uniparty thing when people talk about like the there's a lot of that. And there's a uniparty. Still, like, they, they, do you yeah, think? there's a lot of that. Yeah. It's, but it's because, and this is where the Democrats have a lot more power than the Republicans in a lot of way because they control all the agencies and everything. So you, you want to get to a point where we have more equality in the government. Yeah. And I think you can eventually get to a spot. Don't get me wrong; they're going to be mad if you start cutting employees. Oh <laughs> I mean, yeah. They're going to be they're going to be ticked. For sure. But that being said, I think we need to we need to start figuring out ways to lower the temperature. And I think one of the ways you do that is, even though you're not going to go after him, if President Trump were to pardon Biden, it sends a signal to the country that, like, hey, we're we're trying to come yeah. together. Hmm. I think you got to do something to lower the temperature, or right. we're in, we're in trouble. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think you would do that? No. I don't know. I really don't know what Trump. Golly. I think yeah, he might. Trump, could, might. Could... Trump is one of those guys who might, because yeah. he's, a, he's a showman. He's a good showman, and I think people. It's read... just so hard because it's like, golly, you just you just went after this dude for four years. But that's the perfect guy to like, do it. Oh god, and he's the per- yeah. and he's the guy who would do it. Yeah, I think. But you know, who knows what ideas he's got floating through his head? Right. I don't think there's going to be a four. I don't think there will be four years of revenge under him. Hmm. I don't think it's going to be revenge. I think you'll see cutting because we have budgetary emergencies. Yeah. You know what? That might. It's so hard because, like, yeah, it's you not... want revenge or justice or however you want to word it, but it's also like that would be a powerful statement. It would, and it would be. It would be what Jesus. Just a would, it would be what Jesus would do in this situation. I you think, think so. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. 
you know, earthly matters are not the same as heavenly matters, of course. And I think that, I think we've, I think it, it's going to be, it's going to come down to a, a guy who's been attacked like Trump to be the bigger guy. Yeah. He's going to have to be the one who wow. puts the hand across the aisle mm-hmm. and says, I'll work with you. Wow. And that would, I think, go a long way to fixing a lot of what's wrong with the country today. Because, yeah. you know, you see neighbors not liking their neighbors because they have the wrong sign in their yard. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I don't dislike my neighbors who disagree with me. I may not like Even their the yard. Even the with the rainbow flag? <laughs> no, I, no, I don't care. Like, look, I don't, like, I don't dislike, I don't dislike gays. No, I don't like, I like, Frank, I like everybody. Yeah. I like everybody, right? Like, yeah. what, what you do in your private life doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that people, people can get along. We can all like operate. We can all right. feel safe and you know, disagree and still disagree. Yeah, like yeah. we don't have to have the Gestapo knocking down our door. I heard you supported Trump. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. We don't need that. And and look, our CIA has bigger things to worry about than dad jokes on Facebook. Yeah. So does the FBI. Let's go prosecute real crimes again. Real quick, what time is it right now? Three fourteen. All right, so we have another five or ten minutes. But uh, okay, so then, so that's kind of the political mm-hmm. story, the origin story. Batman Begins. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so what about your what about business? So like you talked about. You, Got in early with like the McDonald's crowd and kind of learned some stuff yeah. under them. And well, I started a few businesses. A and... So after I left DC, I started a, a liquor brand. Okay. I had no idea what I was doing. I, it was idiotic. I somehow managed to maneuver and pull, make something out of that. So this is like 2012, 13, something. Yeah, like that. yeah, exactly. But I, I, I realized I had a knack for finding really good talent. I screwed so much of it up, but so the liquor brand, what, what, what was that, and what happened there? I sold a piece of it out uh, in the end. I ended up doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, but we did have a lady defraud the company out of two hundred fifty thousand dollars <laughs> one month. Two hundred fifteen thousand. Two hundred fifty. Yeah. Jeez. And she tried to blame it on me. How did she? Like, what did she do to defraud the? Um, well, I did catch a, an expense when she was in the Ve- at a Vegas show okay. where she spent $60 on ice cream. And I st- that made me say, well, that's not right. Yeah. So I started looking around and I saw she was staying in resorts with her boyfriend. And she, she, she'd she set up a bunch of um, dummy companies to, to bill us for uh, things like labels and bottles. And no way. There was no labels and bottles attached to it. Right. So her oh and her gosh. friends all got together like a band of gypsies and ripped us off. How long did that happen before you realized what was going on? Pretty quick. Okay. About, about a month, month and a half, maybe wow. two months worth of shit. Golly. So we got ripped off, and then she tried. <clears throat> they tried sicking the IRS after me because she stole our uh, our tax money, our to- yeah. the money that was like pulled out of employees for tax. But I had already been. Tra- she just stole it. She yeah. just drained the account. But then I was already transferring over the power to. I didn't even have power of the company at that point. Yeah. I'd already been transferring everything over to management to them. So they said. So the IRS comes calling. I met the greatest IRS agent. So you can't say all, all of them are bad. Like I met okay. this amazing <laughs> IRS agent. Yeah. This guy, I actually like the IRS. Okay. You oh, know why? Wow. Because they're the smartest. They'll negotiate. Okay. And they, they're not. These are. That's the smartest federal agency is the IRS. Hmm. I swear, hmm. like I love them. I think they're good people. My uncle was a, one of the top guy at the IRS, and unnecessary but kind. Somebody, like. need, <laughs> somebody needs to collect the collect the revenue, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless. Okay, Mr. Democrat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so I think so. I I would say, yeah. So I got out of that. I was able to get out, but yeah. I was able to turn the IRS on them. The bad guys. Okay. Yeah. It was so it was amazing. So I found out later she went around stealing people's brands and bankrupting other companies. Oh my and gosh. She's like a horrible gypsy. We found a past on her that we didn't find then. It was twelve years of like bankrupting this like bunch of houses, like you oh know, like gosh. putting it into foreclosure. Just a bunch of weird stuff that I'm not a How fi- is she not in jail? 
at that point. Because our system really isn't designed to go after the bad guys. Yeah. Well, especially like Not financial well. yeah. related crimes is difficult to. Yeah, it's it's really too it's really too bad. Like every mistake I ever made in business was a mistake. Mm -hmm. I never willfully or defra I never tried to fraud anybody. Never tried to do anybody wrong. Never tried to get the screw the government over or anything like that. Yeah. But there are people who do, and they should they should pay for that. They for absolutely yeah. should. So, anyways, so I go from that. I I learn all the mistakes I had made in raising money and all the things I did wrong. I'm like, dude, I could I probably automate this on a platform. Yeah. And sell it to people. So that's what we started doing. Yeah. And then I, I then I got really screwed. Then I met this partner who is a, um, a, a, a securities attorney. Okay. Who, like, decide, like, I end up making him CEO after a while, and he ends up completely destroying the company. Oh, no. Then I keep making accusations on me because he felt, he just, he couldn't live up to the hype about himself. Was it a similar No, he wasn't like stealing situation? money. He, I don't think he was stealing money at all. But what he was doing was... Uh, accusing me like i took like a very small stipend to stay alive four grand a month yeah tiny right and this guy's like accusing me of fraud because he it wasn't papered up properly but he had definitely given permission to do that and yeah. and i had a witness to that hmm. i had a guy who was a third party witness say no sorry carlos you act we talked about this. Yeah, he tried to pretend like we were some. He was somehow the victim of a big scam, and right. ended up in lawsuits. And him going out, him, him coming after me. I went after him. He's now living in the mountains, uh, skipping. What did around. the company actually do? What did that? What was that? It was basically do? automating the entire fundraising process. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Anyway, so in the process of that, I meet a guy who's in the hydrogen business, which is how we get to what I'm doing today. Yeah. So the hydrogen business guy, I was like, started having coffee with him while I meet him. We put his company on our site and everything. Nicest guy. His name's Scott Dyer. He's one of my partners. Just the nicest dude. And he, um, um, we start meeting and meeting. He starts telling me about this technology that was developed at this university where uh, they figured they could reduce iron in like two seconds. I'm like, man, I bet you I could do something with this. Reduce iron? Yes. What do you mean? Uh, I was like, reduce iron ore to turn and basically gotcha. knock the oxygen off, uh, and you just are left with a metal that can be melted, the okay. iron, in the, uh, in the steel making process. Gotcha. And I was like, I bet you we could, I bet you there's something we could do with this. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I started looking into it. Next thing you know, I got a team around me and yeah. millions of dollars raised, and now we've got more coming. and. Yeah, we got commercial interest from all over the world. We're getting we're getting inundated now with interest because we have a technology that can do things that nobody else can do. Yeah. So there's a big problem in the world in the steel industry. You have uh, about 10 percent of your ore is lost every year, okay. just to being becoming too fine to process or becomes cake material at blast furnaces or electrostatic material at that you know it's all kinds of blast furnaces put off fines that they can't do anything with hmm. they become unusable trash essentially yeah well we can take that and turn that into money yeah turn How? that into your product because we can reduce it we can handle fines directly okay and we can handle very small fines so we can handle anything down to like five microns all the way up to like 250 microns so it's a wide wide range Five microns is way less than like powdered sugar. So, and basically, for for the layman, yeah. a lot of people might not even understand what you're talking about. But like, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody uh, needs to explain this to me. Well, no. Uh, okay, so so basically, you're taking what that ten percent that would have been lost just basically it's just yeah, lost, and we can just right? keep we can keep it as a continuous flow. So you bring it back up to a hundred percent. Basically, yeah, of the of the yeah. usable iron, yeah. And then uh, you were telling me that there's and we clean it, and that that powder can get caught up and clog up machinery. Yeah. So we can really help get rid of a lot of that problem. And so basically, it's increasing efficiency, decreasing loss, and, and then and we're a green technology in the sense that we're flex yeah. fuel actually. 
I mean, we could use coal gas in this thing if we wanted to, but we're not going to do that. All we, right, all right. We, we can use no, green <laughs> hydrogen, blue hydrogen. We can use syn gas, natural gas, you know, you name it. We can basically use it if it can, redu if yeah. it can handle the reduction process. We're the only system that can do that. We're also the only system in the world that can be made in shop. It's small enough that it can be made in shops, shipped, and erected. So yeah. instead of just spending like four years, you'll spend like four months putting this up. So is your machine actually like producing like a... Uh, Iron? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it's a finished product and then they can just use it to build or, or just run it. Just, yeah, they can continuously run it through our system. We're actually working on a, a process where we don't even have to briquette at all, but we can... It pops out briquettes. Okay. Of iron, which are heavy enough that it can be fed into the um, steel making process. So, so you, okay. you can put it into a furnace and it doesn't blow it out the top. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, that's uh, that's a nutshell what we do. We're getting a ton of commercial interest now. Yeah. Uh, are you still looking for investors? Yeah, I think uh, um, we're getting close to done with that, actually. But How big do you think that like this technology could be? Um, well, huge because, uh, yeah, it, it, it'll be a big deal in the industry. That's a, okay. It's a very big deal. And then there's other things we're what's, working what's on. What's a big deal? Like what? Many, many, many billions of dollars. Really? Yeah. yeah I think it'll be a big deal. Hmm. Yeah. Is there that much demand for? Well, for think about doing? it. So the steel industry is what? $2 trillion a year. Okay. 10% of that is lost. Yeah. Every year. Yeah. And we're the only people who can solve that. Wow. Surely there's like, do you have any competitors? There's no one even like trying to remotely There's one group that's tried. They have not been able to successfully, I think, actually keep a system running. Yeah. We're, we have, mm. we've actually, we've got a lot of IP around what we're doing. So. Yeah. It's very exciting what we're, what yeah. we're accomplishing because... Like we have, they right now you can't use traditional valves. We're design, designing our own valves, for example. Like we can't. There's a lot of reasons why powder. Are you tough. fabricating your own parts? Are you no, we're sending. That we're outsourcing. We're going to outsource the fabrication of the units uh, moving forward. Yeah. Moving so, yeah. so, so if someone wanted to invest in your business and your company, how how would they go about doing that? What? How did they reach out to you? And oh, that's that's tough because you got to have a million dollar net worth. And, okay. We've basically got a group of investors out there that have been very good to us, and it uh, looks like we're about to finish our last round. So yeah, yeah. Well, is there anything that you want to like shout out or promote, or or any final words that you want to say before we close it here? Shout out or promote? Yeah. Perdomo cigars. Yeah, per, go Perdomo. <laughs> Just like, put me on your. Uh... Yeah, we need a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Come on, right. Perdomo. It's good cigars. and um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, all good. I'm good. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you for meeting with me today, and, and we'll have to do it again sometime in the future. Yes, yeah, sir. Heck yeah, bro. Oh, dude, wait. You got to tell us about your ring. You got to tell us about your Oh, ring. sorry. This is, a, uh, this is a Masonic ring, which I'm actually not a <laughs> member of, but I kept getting accused of being a member of um, uh, conspiracies. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Being as I had connection to the White House and some famous people and things yeah. like that, yeah. so people kept thinking I was a member of a conspiracy. So I finally saw this at a fair and I bought it. There you go. All right. Well, I do appreciate. I it, hope man. the Masons don't kill me now. Oh yeah, you're definitely a number one target. So all right, man. Well, I appreciate it. Sounds yeah, good, thanks bro. Thanks for doing it, man. Thanks, dude.